so next would be again that would be not doing no test at all no testing probability of failure on demand would be for example 0 0.034 that's here would be corresponding to uh, mid so, so one and we I if we in include proof testing the probability of failure on demand will be reduced why because we're testing the equipment and we're making sure that it's working so the probabilities that it's going to work when it's required are going to be much higher right so or the probability of failure will be very low the probabilities of success will be higher so that means i will have a higher seal to a better reliability and my probability of failure on demand will be lower than the 0 0.034 just by proof testing every year right including the uh, imperfect proof testing if you want so there's also uh, this is uh, what we've been talking about all these tables the tables about um, relationship between probability of failure or safety availability or uh, reliability of the safety of the safety implemented function right so one minus pfd that would be r with respect to reliability so at the beginning of time we consider the system to be very reliable high reliability and as time goes by its reliability decreases so this is another way of looking at in time what happens to your equipment with respect to working when required to work uh, so as time goes by its reliability goes down or its um, probabilities of success go down and then if you proof test your equipment at that time well this the curve starts again you assume that it uh, has this, uh, the same reliability when you put it there at the first time and you continue working in that way as long as you're doing proof testing so what is important to notice here is what happens if you proof test your equipment more so if you proof test your equipment more or less so if you proof test your equipment less that means that your reliability goes down so if we put it before your reliability by proof testing more often was higher if i proof test less often then my probability of failure on demand average goes to a, a sil2 for example right so it was a sil3 now a sil2 so sometimes uh, practi uh, sometimes uh, end users, you ask them what what is the f uh, how often have you tested your equipment? So well, we've never done a proof test in our equipment. So that means that uh, if you thought that you had a very hi uh, highly um, reliable or low probability of failure on demand on your equipment equivalent to a CO3, well, today if you never tested it before, your the probabilities of that equipment failing are very high maybe you don't even have a safety integrity level at all right so this th that's therefore the importance of keeping up that proof testing and don't miss in the proof testing don't postpone your proof testings for the next turnaround uh, that's not good idea next uh, with continuing with the uh, flow of things or the activities that you do in a project for example what are the steps the first steps and there would be and I think that we already went through the quadrants so quadrant number one two three four so in the f what happens what are the steps in quadrant number one for example is hazard identification you might be doing a HACCP or you might be um, doing a failure mode and effect analysis of a process right then you risk ranking risk reduction if needed or you find out what are the safeguards available you risk rank again and then if you have a gap you construct your safety implemented function and that safety implemented function will be uh, will have a specific uh, performance level and will have a, that a specific safety integrity level and uh, that was given by layer protection analysis for example or a risk graph and all of it also pay, uh, working with um, as low as reasonable practicable so this will give us uh, what is the tolerable frequency how toler what is our tolerable place right so how much can we tolerate so how much we can tolerate a certain amount of risk with respect to, to having certain controls in there so that's the idea so in this flow 
uh, we start with um, what is seal verification. So now we went through first quadrant and now we're coming into the second quadrant. So coming into the second quadrant uh, of the quad model or the safety life cycle. So now we have to verify through inspection and calculations that the safety implemented function achieved the, the required safety integrity level. Which was the required safety integrity level? Well, the one that was discovered during the layer protection analysis. That means as previously determined by the seal determination method that we use. Best for now, the one is the most popular method that is being now being used uh, uh, more often and often by different companies and facilities is layer protection analysis. It's more a little bit more quantitative than the completely qualitative method, which is the risk graph. So what are the factors that influence the performance of that safety intermediate function? So in Safeguard Profiler, we would have the capability to um, work with certain factors. What are those factors that influence that probability of failure in demand? So susceptibility to common cause failures. That's common cause or beta factor. We'll talk about that. How does that influence the probability of failure on demand? How does that influence the seal level of your system? What can I do in order to have that under control and to give me uh, the capabilities of reaching certain probability of failure on demand? And then we'll have the safety failure fraction um, that gives me certain architecture constraints. And this saf safety failure fraction is with respect to what is the fraction of uh, failures, of failure rates uh, that are dangerous failures? Or what are the safe failures with respect to the total failures? You can look at them uh, because there are percentages of, well, if you have the all total safe failures, uh, what is the fraction of that with respect to the total failures? And we will see how that, uh, what is the influence on that on the probability of failure on demand. So what is really important for us in this case is to find out what is the um, dangerous failure fraction. So the safe failure fraction indirectly will give us the dangerous failure fraction, right? One minus the other one. So another factor that influences the failure rate is the failure rate. They influence the probability of failure in demand. Mean time of restoration while I'm restoring my equipment that means I'm vulner vulnerable to uh, a, a mishap ha coming in and happening. So that my the demand might happen and I'm restoring my system. My system is not available. So that's an exposure time. I am exposed to danger at that moment. Therefore, during these times, I should start thinking about contingencies. I, what do I do I, um, in addition to my safety, safe, safety instrumented function that at that moment is not there, what can I do in order not to lose that risk reduction factor that I was providing before? If you read the standards, it is required to have the same amount of uh, risk reduction by implementing other safeguard uh, procedure, for example. Uh, so then we have diagnostic coverage. We'll see what the influence has that into the uh, what factor, uh, that's another factor that has an influence on the calculation of the probability of failure on demand. And then we already talked about the proof test interval. How does that affect uh, the probability of failure on demand? That's uh, one of the most important factors that we have to look at. So between the failure rate dangers and the probability uh, on the proof test interval, between those two parameters are the big influencers in our equation. And uh, Safeguard Profiler will show you that you can do what we call sensitivity analysis. So how sensitive is the tool? How sensitive is that number when you change either the probability of failure on demand, or when you change the failure rate or any other of these factors that I'm showing in there? And finally, it related to the proof test interval. It is the test coverage, test coverage factor, and the safety li uh, or the useful life of your equipment. So your equipment, according to the manufacturer, has a useful life of 15 years, 10 years. So you have to take into account that when we're uh, considering that uh, we have imperfect proofs testing, right? So in order to add that percentage and so on that we discussed before. 
So the safeguard profiler will allow you to do that. So now we go into a flowchart, and this flowchart will tell uh, have kind of a roadmap of uh, the tasks and the things that you have to that we have to know first, and that we have to do in order to calculate or in order to arrive to the um, uh, number. What is the number? Of wh what would be the probability of failure on demand of uh, safety independent function. Safety independent function, it is made of sensors, logic solvers, and final elements, right? So we put them all together. How do they interact between them, b between each other? And then so that we can calculate this number. So each equipment will have its own failure rate. Each equipment will have its diagnostic coverage uh, depending on how intelligent it is or, or not, uh, and so on. So we're going to go through each one of these factors and we'll talk about what do they mean. We need to understand this in order to properly use Safeguard Profiler. If we don't know what that means, we're going to have a little bit of trouble in uh, uh, doing uh, a good job. All right, so let's see what's the next one. So let's start with the mean time to restoration. Uh, so what does that mean? So it's a accumulation of times. So mean time to restoration is important because that is time that gonna we're going to be exposed to a probable uh, demand, right? So if the demand happens at that time, we're exposed because that safeguard is not going to work. Hopefully, you will have your contingency in play, right? So you will have that other mitigating uh, safeguard that is in there covering for your uh, time that you're re uh, restoring this safeguard, right? So the mean time to restore is usually most of the time given in hours. So is the time required to detect the failure? So if you have diagnostics on your equipment, that's good. It will take you less time to restore your system back to full uh, functioning. Any time period uh, during which repairs are not possible. Sometimes you're not able, you didn't have your spare parts with you. You just uh, start to look for them. That's not a good idea. So you should already have your spurs parts with you if you uh, don't want to stop in the middle right uh, you don't want to trip an unnecessary trip of your process so try to have your spare parts with you with the right um, uh, versions and revision levels and so on don't start looking at that moment for the, those parts so have them ready in there what is the time required to repair uh, after diagnostic analysis and then because what is you want to make sure that what you're replacing or what you're re uh, repairing and then later on restoring it is exactly what it was wrong with your system right and then the time required to verify that the repair was uh, done correctly so what would you do well you validate the safety implemented function functionality you do a proof test right you test again your safeguard so that uh, it is working in perfect conditions and after you assure yourself that your safeguard is in proper working conditions then uh, then you can put it back uh, as a uh, as full protecting your or reducing your risk that was necessary before so that was um, mean time to restoration the next one uh, is uh, evaluation or diagnostic of components in a safety implemented function can improve the availability and safety integrity performance of the system uh, or the safety function. So that we're looking at uh, failure rates at the moment, right? So we have failure rate total is um, some failures are, are we consider those safe failures and some other failures we consider dangerous failures. If we detect them, so those dangerous detected failures are because we can restore the system or we can um, we can as soon as we know that something is wrong now they became uh, uh, safe failures because I, 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 I implement right away this contingency in play and then I can start restore my system and I'm not I'm trying not to be exposed to risk so as that's why these uh, uh, dangerous detected failures are considered safe failures, right? So then the ones that are dangerous undetected ones, those are the real bad ones. They are going to show up only when the, the system is, the safety implemented function is demanded to work 
or during a proof test, right? So that's when these dangerous undetected failures are going to show up. So these ones are the ones that are we are we will be concerned. That's those are the uh, the ones that uh, the standards IC sixty one five eleven are concerned, the most concerned for them. So that would be failure rates due to they are dangerous and they are undetected. They're going to show up only when you do a proof test or when you need it to work. That's bad. All the other ones, there are certain point of view safe failures and uh, there are spurious trips, right? Spurious failures, uh, in a sense. So you can divide them here in the quadrants. Uh, so there's a, a pie chart. And here's the um, dangerous, never detected uh, failures. Those are the ones that some people consider they are there. Uh, they are a very tiny part, but they're still there. And some people say that might go about more than or to a, up to a 10% of the total failures in 15 years for the useful life of the equipment. Uh, that's what is uh, not accounted for the imperfect proof testing. Some people uh, decide not to consider this because it's very small. Some people decide that to consider uh, because it's uh, important for them. So those are those uh, failure rates that we have there. Diagnostic coverage. So the diagnostic coverage is defined as the ratio ratio of detected failure rate to the total failure rate of the component or system as detected by diagnostic test. And something very important, diagnostics coverage does not include any false detected uh, proof testing right so now we have ways of detecting uh, failures in your equipment and the equipment and one it is can be detected while the equipment is running or while the equipment it is in uh, its mission time and, uh, and the other one is during proof testing so we discover dangerous undetected uh, proof testing and we discover all the other ones uh, with diagnostic coverage uh, while well the equipment it is um, uh, waiting for this uh, possible or probable um, demand that, that might happen, right? So there's a, a ratio there that happens there. Diagnostic coverage is a ratio of dangerous detected to total dangerous failures. Dangerous detected plus the undetected. And manufacturers will tell you how much is that. So that also has an influence in your probability of failure on demand, of course. So we have here um, the small formulas and they're in percentage, right? So uh, failure rates detected are the percentage of uh, a certain percentage of the, o the total dangerous failures. And dangerous undetected is, of course, one minus the diagnostic coverage of the other one, right? Of the detected ones. So we have here the partition of the dangerous uh, failures detected and undetected. And these undetected are failures not detectable by diagnostic tests. 